Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome. Thank you for tuning in today. We're going to be dealing with a lot of fun stuff going on related to vulnerability management. That's what we're here for. And looking at prioritization. Oh, my goodness. All those fun hundreds of thousands of vulnerabilities. And how can we solve those problems? Ah, I know we have the problems. So I'm Jonathan Risto. Thanks again for joining in. I'm one of the uh, SANS co-authors for the Management 516, securing, uh, Managing Security Vulnerabilities, Enterprise and Cloud, and SANS instructor. And I'm going to help talk today through some of the variety of contextual information that we're going to want to take a look at when we're dealing with vulnerability prioritization. Because context really is... is it's a bit of a cliche, I know, but context is king. It's going to help us get the information we need to help deal with prioritization. So if you have any questions over the course of the live stream, please feel free to put them right out there. I can see it pop up on my screen. I'll see if I'll be able to answer them, get to the questions live as we're going through here. So without further ado, let's just get into some of this stuff about vulnerability prioritization. Now, where we all start off, from a contextual information perspective, we have that little thing called CVSS. You know, that nice little scoring system we have that gives us a value from, in theory, zero through 10 to help tell us how important the, the vulnerability is. And that, if you really need to know and want to understand and dive into that ugly formula that's associated with creating those, it's available for us online through the MITRE website, CVE. Uh, you can get in and get all the details around it. But it factors in, as you know, the details in regards to how the exploitability, the attack vector coming in, and some basic information even on how it impacts us from the um, vulnerability perspective of the confidentiality, in uh, integrity, and the availability, the CIA triad. So all that kind of information is factored in to generate that score. So that's really where most organizations end up starting with. And we, we look at it is the piece of information we want to have and need to have. So that bit of context is always what we tend to start in foundational work for us to deal with our prioritization. That and all of our tools have it in there, be it version two or version three that we're running. Yeah, we use that bit of context about the vulnerability because it helps us understand just how important it is of a problem. Is it a, a 4.5 medium level problem? Is it a 9.8? Oh my goodness, the sky's almost falling because it's nearly a 10. That bit of context information. But what do we want to do to help understand? Because I still going to have 100,000 vulnerabilities, maybe even millions of vulnerabilities inside my environment. How do I start getting to that to understand which of those, and I'll probably keep picking on 100,000 vulnerabilities, which one of those really is the challenge that I need to deal with first? And that's where we get into the context. And here I'm going to throw a bit of a reference from a movie out there for, for those of you. Hopefully you've seen the movie Shrek. I know it's been out for a while. Nice big green ogre. I mean, kind of looks like me, um, except I'm not green. But what we have in there, when um, after his swamp gets taken over by all the fairy tale teachers, he goes talk to Lord Farquaad, and he's going on his mission. Him and Donkey, as they're going through there, they're walking through a field, and he's like going, like, because... Um, Donkey's asking about what ogres are like, and he's got, picks up an onion and go, ogres are like onions. And Donkey's like going, what, smelly, stinky, make your breath bad, stuff like this. And it's no, because they have layers and ogres have layers. And for us, what we need to do is use the layers that we have available of contextual information to help us actually get to the prioritization. 
And for those that are in, that have seen the Shrek movie, this isn't saying all of the people that talk to us about which is the most important vulnerability or question us on the vulnerability management side are like Donkey and I'll quote Shrek here that um, irritable miniature beast of burden. That's not what I'm saying our CIOs are and CISOs are. But it's trying to get through the layers of information we need to understand and get to really the nugget at the center of which truly are the information sources that are the vulnerabilities we need to be based on the contextual info so what we yeah, get out of my swamp i like that one <laughs> yes. get out of my swamp. anyways i have three kids i have lots of um streaming that goes on around the house and yes i do have a a little bit of a cartoon features and i like disney anyways so regardless we'll try and stay away from shrek for the rest of it but um yeah if i start growing the little things out my ears turning green you'll know why Regardless, let's get, let's get back over into our contextual information. And it's really going to be broken up into three kinds of groups of contextual information. And the first one I'm going to carry on talking about is related to the vulnerabilities, just like CVSS is. So we're going to get some contextual information and talk about that on the related to vulnerabilities. And one example that we use is vulnerability age. How old is the vulnerability? So if I take a look purely at vulnerabilities I have in my environment, one that is labeled out as, uh, let's say, the CVE number, for those that maybe, maybe you don't know this, but if you take a look at the CVE number, the start of it is the year it was actually published. And then the, uh, the item that's at the end of it for the five-digit string, that's actually done incrementally from one that's been requested. So even if you don't have a publication date for your CVEs, you can find out which one is older based on which year it was published and the lower number of CVE would be an older vulnerability. But vulnerability age is often a thing that's used as well because, hey, a vulnerability from 2005 might be a bigger problem than a vulnerability from 2015, 2021. But there's also danger in that front as well. But it's contextual information trying to give us more details to understand. But the problem with just using vulnerability age, as probably a lot of you are agreeing and understand, is just because it's been out for a long time doesn't mean there's actually exploits for it or it's a problem in my environment or maybe there's compensating controls I have put in place already. And that will actually come into play for a lot of our different contextual information. And I'll talk about compensating controls again coming up. But just purely based on age, while it works, it may not be the only piece of information that we want to take a look at. But that's one aspect related to vulnerabilities themselves. Another one, contextual information that we want to start layering in, or in all honesty, I like to think of it as kind of reverse onion. I'm starting with this big onion and I'm peeling back the layers of information to see where is that nugget right at the center. Think of it like an oyster. I'm trying to peel in and get the pearl out of the middle so I get the information I need and can understand out of those 100,000 vulnerabilities, which 10 really are important or which 100 so I can get and understand and prioritize those. Vulnerability age is one piece of contextual information. Another one is the number of vulnerabilities. Now, I remember when I first started out vulnerability management, we threw out our vulnerability scanner. We scanned the environment and went, oop. Um, all kinds of problems inside the environment. And then, okay, what do we want to do? Let's tackle the big numbers that are out there. So where do we have problems all over the place instead of those one of snowflakes? So looking at the numbers of vulnerabilities is another piece of contextual information that can help us get to prioritization. Because if we want to look comparing between two vulnerabilities inside my environment, if I've got one where I only have it on one system and I've got one that's on 150 systems, the risk associated with this is probably higher where I have 150, or maybe it's across the whole organization, compared to just the one system. That's barring any other contextual information that we're going to talk about coming up as well. But if I just want to get rid of the biggest amount of risk, looking at the number of vulnerabilities is yet another piece of information that we can use and leverage the contextual aspects to help us understand what's important. Hmm, not a bad idea. And the reason I mentioned these two first, because it's often when we're first starting out, we just throw a scanner. This is the kind of information that's quick and easily available to us. And so we can quickly do some triage from this perspective. 
as we start getting to some of our other contextual information, I'm going to have to do some work in my vulnerability management program only because when we start looking at assets, which is where I'm going next with some contextual information related to assets, oh, I'm going to have to think, I'm going to work. I maybe have to put information into a system so it gets to be more complex for us to deal with. So these couple right at the start, purely related to the vulnerabilities. Our scanners have found it. We've got the CVS score, the age of the vulnerability and the numbers out there tends to be where a lot of organizations first start their triaging with until they can get some of the further context that I'm going to end up talking about here right now. And I alluded to this asset context. And what I mean by asset context, this is, again, just more information available for us, but it's related to the assets in question. And the asset can be the hardware software asset. So where is this stored? Where is this inside my environment? The location. It could be a function. It can also be tying back to asset owners. And we'll go into all three of these right now. So first one, let's say asset function. For contextual information, this will help me understand more about the vulnerabilities. And I'm going to keep saying context all through today because that is what we want to worry about. That is what we're dealing with. More details about our vulnerabilities. Asset context. Let's take a look at one of the items, uh, layers in essence, if you want to look at it that way, is the asset function. Think about this. A simple example would be, okay, it's a web server sitting in the DMZ that takes orders for my systems. Okay, that's its function. Compared to an internal intranet web server that's just hosting information so we could send uh, details out inside our company. So the function of the assets can be put in and used to help us prioritize because now I'm going to be able to see, okay, an order taking system maybe that's a little more important than my internal internet server, intranet server, sorry, if that's the information I have available and they have the same vulnerabilities. Now I'm going to be able to have that, pardon me, and be able to make some decisions around which vulnerability to deal with first. As an example, that's a simple example. We know our networks aren't quite that easy for us, but as we start looking at the asset function, is it involved with finance? Is it involved with our order taking? Is it dealing with customer information? I can start to get some prioritization related to the function of the asset, and that'll help peel a little bit more of the less important vulnerabilities to start get down to the more core ones that are really the true priority for us. So asset function is one other piece of information we can use and layer on top as we slowly build this out. Now, as we're stepping through this, you're probably going to see, I've already talked about four things. Here, yeah, four fingers are up, as opposed to, yeah, three, yeah, no, four. We have four pieces of information so far. We might not be using all of the different pieces of contextual information that I'm talking about as we step through. It can be a combination of any of these, or it might only be one. Let's go back and say it's just the CVSS score. Maybe that's all I'm going to be able to do. But you can layer different parts, different components of this. You don't have to use all, what do I have here? I've got 10 things I'm going to talk about today. I don't have to use them all. I can use what is relevant for me and my organization and what I have the capability to do. Because we, as we continue to move through the prioritization, and the layers of contextual information we want to put on them, this gets more and more complex, requires more tools, more features, more functionality, and in all honesty, probably some more analysts to help us deal with this. So having that available, that context information, we might have to build out over time as we're building and launching and maturing our vulnerability management program. So just wanted to throw that out now to make sure you don't have to do all of these Use what you're able to inside the organization and can leverage at this point in time and plan as we move along. So stepping back into assets right now, we have another piece of information often with our assets, and this could be the data stored on the asset. Pardon me. 
or it could actually be the asset itself. And I'm thinking here is asset value. Okay, let's say you are, let's say Coca-Cola, Pepsi, one of those. And what is the secret sauce for how you actually make your soft drink? Yeah, that's a critical piece of information. High value for us. So what we have, what we want to do, we want to protect that. There's vulnerabilities on a system in that case. Yeah, maybe I'll want to prioritize getting that remediated so no one's going to be able to exploit that vulnerability on the system compared to, oh, I'll pick on the CEO's laptop. Yeah, they're never in their office. They're always in meetings doing people. They're not doing anything on their laptops. So that's a lower priority compared to the secret sauce. Now, I'll argue the the executive assistant to the CEO and the rest of the C-suite, oh yeah, they've got lots of good information and coordinating, doing stuff. Yeah, we'll want to prioritize those. But the asset value, and as I said, this could be either the data on it or what the, tying back a bit to the function. How important is this to my company to be able to use, to have this asset? So let's say you're an online company. That's the only way you're getting your revenue. Your order taking system is probably going to be the highest value for you inside the company compared to, I don't know, Jonathan Risto's desktop system sitting back over there that he never uses because he's working at home now. The asset value. That is another piece of context that we can start to use to help break apart that 100,000 vulnerabilities into manageable chunks. The final piece I'm going to talk about right now related to assets and I'll circle back to this probably when I'm done at the or at the end as well, is related to asset owners. And you're probably going to think, okay, asset owners, why would I care about that piece of contextual information? Why is this important to me? Well, if you think about it, the system administrator, let's, let's go this route at the moment, the administrative owner of the system that I need to work with to get the remediation effort done, Okay, they're responsible, say, for three, three servers inside my environment because they're really busy, heavy use servers, clusters that are there, and that is all they're going to be working on. If I have that contextual information, that's great. But when I'm sending vulnerabilities out for prioritization to getting remediation effort done, having it grouped by the asset owner, and this can be for getting the work done or the business approval, so the business owner, it's putting it relevant in the terms that matter to them. That system administrator doesn't care about if they look after, let's say, Windows system. They couldn't care less about the Linux system sitting next door because it's not theirs. So sending them a prioritized list that includes the Linux vulnerabilities might not matter. Actually, it probably won't matter to that administrator. Or they might, hey, I don't have to do anything because it's all in their box. But if we can break items up for our reporting, passing out the details based on asset owner for approval or getting remediation efforts done. Another great piece of contextual information to prioritize it and relevant for that individual in question. It'll tie into when we're generating the reports, getting the remediation efforts work all done. We can layer it in and break it up. So when I have, let's say we have 10 system administrators in my organization, I can have them prioritized for each of those individuals and maybe we can only get one done by each system administrator for 10 vulnerabilities in total. Compared to, I have a prioritized list of just 10 vulnerabilities of the top problems to solve. Three are with the first system administrator, two are with the second, and the rest of them are with a third. Nobody else has problems on their systems in that top 10. I can't get all the remediation efforts done as quickly. So focusing on what is relevant to that individual, huge benefit for us to try and get work completed and helping break apart that layer and uh, the big blob of 100,000 vulnerabilities to get to the meaningful chunks to get the work. Because that ultimately is what we're trying to do with all of this contextual information and getting our prioritization. How do I get remediation efforts done? While breaking it up by owner does help you get some of the remediation efforts done, fully agree with that. Some of you might be thinking, but that may not, I may be dealing with vulnerabilities that are a lower risk, an overall picture for my company. So why do I want to get those worked on? It's a valid point. It really is, I think. But if you think about it, if I have the ability 
to get some work done to help continue to remove risk, even if it's say it's not the top 10 overall problems, there's still high risk problems for that device in question or that business unit or that administrator, it's still gonna be a good thing to remove from our environment. And if we have the time to get that remediation effort done, let's do it. We may not solve all of the 10 high problems, but I'm gonna get rid of 10 problems in my environment, the highest in that area of focus. So that's how asset owners can help us out. So here we are thinking, we've talked a little bit about the vulnerability aspects. So do a small recap. We looked at the CVSS, how that contextual, or the vulnerability age or the number of vulnerabilities. So those three items mentioned off for contextual. Also have mentioned off from an asset perspective, the function, the value on the asset, be it data or it's the asset physically itself, second point on the asset. And the third one is the asset owners. Wow, six pieces of context I can start gathering inside my environment. But what you need, as I said, as we're stepping into some of this, the asset, I need to get a good understanding of my environment. I need to know the, the importance of data. Where is my data in my environment? Or let's go a little more fundamental. What assets do I have? I need to understand my asset inventory and have a good one in the environment. And some of you may be thinking, oh my goodness, asset inventory. That is like, we don't have a good one. Yeah, recognize that. But we have to, that's a key thing for us in vulnerability management, or we can't continue to advance our programs. If I don't know what assets are out there, how can I protect it? If I don't know what assets are out there, how can I ensure I have the coverage for all of the software and hardware and different type of devices? If I don't have the assets, I don't know who might be in charge of them, who's managing them, or is that system... Really, no one's looking at it anymore. Ooh. Interesting. But yeah, that asset inventory. Yeah, we kind of need it. We need it regardless. But as we want to layer on more and more contextual information, I also need a spot to put some of this. So is there a CMDB inside the organization that we can leverage, put extra fields in? If I'm looking at it from a cloud perspective, maybe it'll actually be some tags we'll use. So I can have a tag for asset owner. I might have it for business owner. I could have it for system administrator and have those tags filled out. Now, when I'm actually doing the queries through the APIs, I could request that I only want the information related to those tags. Help me break it down. And if it's not all there, recognize that. But as we find more information, get the tags included and we have the ability if we don't, if when a new assets getting created, if you don't have mandatory tags included, don't let the asset get created. Sorry, you're not able to do that. You don't have the mandatory tag and filled out. It is possible for us to do this. So just as we continue to get access to the data on the asset front, owner front, continue to populate this. If the only way you have available to you is spreadsheet or some kind of external format like that, that's what we're gonna to have to use. I have seen it, I've dealt with it, and I've run with having that spreadsheet of masterful data that we keep updating. But also make sure you're willing to share it with the rest of your IT group. Just to do a little public service announcement here from that front. Yeah, because most other groups actually need the info too. So let's all collaboratively work together instead of stovepiping silos us out here. So yeah, they've got a copy of it and they've got a copy and we've got a copy. Yeah, let's all work together. So, oh, I, I appreciate it. I see there's a comments uh, coming up here in the Slack. I've been trying to watch them here. There's lots of the greetings. We've got people from all over the place. I see India, we got Ghana, we got the US based. I think I saw a Canadian in there too. I'm Canadian. But um, yeah, some great comments coming up as well. So here, that's just some of the context we want to deal with. I haven't seen any questions. I don't think I answered already. Oh, oh, I did see one in here. Medium vulnerabilities can be chained to have critical business importance. Looking at the CVSS doesn't justify it. Yeah, one should always consider attack scenarios and business impact. Oh, I like that one because it's where I'm going next. I appreciate that lead in. It was great to see that up there in there. But what in context I'm going to talk about next really starts to tie into, I'll call it threat intelligence type information. 
that's ultimately where some of it, it it ultimately comes down to. And some of our tools are terming it that way. And then if we even get into some custom or our own internal threat intelligence, but layering on for us the extra information in related to threat intelligence. So first one, we see this available in our tools. We got it in Rapid7, we got it in Qualys. It's available for us on any of the scanners. We're getting some basic threat intelligence and we see more and more of that coming online with tools um, in the classic vulnerability scanners, or we see it in things like the Brinkas, the Kennas as well, um, is threat intelligence. And first one I wanna talk about from a contextual information we wanna understand is exploit availability. Now, okay, is there an exploit for the vulnerability? Why do you think I might want to understand if there's an exploit? For start with, I've got a big sphere of vulnerabilities, all known vulnerabilities. There's only a subset of those that actually have known exploits. So if I can prioritize it down to a, no, uh, a known exploit being available, that will help me know, hey, I've got a vulnerability and there's actually a way for someone to take advantage of this. Now, I recognize there are um, non-published exploits available in a wide variety of places, be it from, um, you might be able to find some on the commercial front. Uh, you definitely can probably find some available from a governmental um, and some of our other malicious actors that are out there, be it organized crime, et cetera, having uh, malware available for and exploits available for vulnerabilities that haven't been disclosed yet. But knowing if there's an exploit is going to help us again, peel back some of the vulnerabilities to get to the ones that really I need to work on right now. <laughs> See some good questions coming in there. We'll get to those in a second. But with that exploit availability, it's going to help me know, hey, I, there's a vulnerability. It's say a CVSS score 10. And if I layer in some of my extra contextual information we've talked about, I have a server that is public facing in some format. And it actually has, it's my order taking. So I know it's successful from the outside and it's doing an important function and there's an exploit available for it. You can see how this starts to percolate that vulnerability and that effort we want to remediate higher up the chain. And you'll notice I may be saying remediate the vulnerability as opposed to saying patch it because our remediation efforts do not always include patching. We can do, you can call it virtual patch, compensating controls, whatever it is that you want to call them. But if I put, let, let's go an extreme compensating control, I take the system completely off the network. It is now a standalone device. You physically would have to walk to that computer, sit down and type at a keyboard and it's only attached to that system. I have, if I want any data in, it comes in on a DVD or like a USB device, taking it out same ways. There's a pretty good compensating control there for us. So I might not have to worry about getting that prioritized and remediated as fast as, as I mentioned, one that could be sitting public facing. So understanding what's in place with compensating controls is a factor, but it's also a way we can remediate the problems. And I'll tie back into compensating controls again. So I see there was some question in here. We've got, uh, we've got, okay, no, that one's just coming from E to or Vulnerability needs to exist in the environment for older software support. Is it up to the vulnerability manager to know the why it exists? We need to be able to ask the question in regards to why. So thank you, uh, Matt, for that one, appreciate it. But yeah, we, we need to ask the question of why this does need to exist. I don't think we need to be the go-to resource inside the organization that has the corporate knowledge on why all of those legacy apps actually exist and why we can't patch it. But we in vulnerability management, be it if you're the analyst, be it you're the manager, or be it actually even in CISO who will care about vulnerability management, we need to make sure that that why is known in the organization and we need to make sure that that why that is existed or what someone says is the problem has been agreed to because that's going to tie back into our exemptions. So, um, and 
yeah, exemptions will be the best way to describe that. Because if we have a, a vulnerability that cannot be remediated, and this is a legacy system of why it actually exists, the history, why I can't get an upgrade done, that needs to be documented and has to get agreed to and accepted by the organization. So not totally into our context, but it's giving us contextual information around why that problem can't get dealt with. So that does have to be documented. I don't want to be the only one that has all this info. So it has to be made available and it definitely has to get approved by, let's argue, the Vulnerability Management Steering Committee. It could even be from a board level, depending on how important this is to the organization and the amount of risk that's associated with it. But ultimately, it's documenting that risk and that it's actually accepted. And I'll just get onto my soapbox for anybody who may have taken Management 516. I harp on this a little bit. Um, is exceptions, you need to have them time bound so that they're at least going to be regularly reviewed to see if they're relevant or the reasoning behind the exception having been granted is actually still valid. Let's take, we have a new vulnerability that comes in on in-house application software that we have developed. Great. My, the application development team is fully backlogged. They, they're, they've got at least six months backlog, if not more. So the exception is granted because they cannot take the time to get the work on it. So an exception to deal with that vulnerability, maybe we put some compensating controls in place. But with those compensating controls and we have the exception, exception approval, it's like, okay, you can't work on this for six months. So starting in six months, there should be time in the backlog, get it put in there so they can actually start working on it. The exception may be granted for nine months but I want to make sure that they're actually starting to work on this as opposed to you've got to get out a jail card for exception and I never have to look at this again. So in that six months when they aren't supposed to work on it, make sure it gets into the backlog. I'd ask a few questions when we're getting close. Is it in the backlog? When do you expect to be working on it? And then maybe it's six months, I'd ask again. And when we're getting close to the expiry, it's like, yeah, this one's coming up due again. Have you been able to remediate it as so it's not trying to pester, but it's almost reminding of some of the problems that they said they'd help resolve. And then when that exception comes up again and the development team goes, yeah, we can't work on this. Well, we planned for this already. How come you didn't put it into your backlog and workflow so you could actually get to it? So that all ties into the exceptions, but it definitely we wanna make sure that we have a time bound exception granted for applications. And any of the problems really, it doesn't, not just applications, it could be a system, it could be a hardware component, any of those. So make sure you tie it in from that perspective. So I'll leave that one alone. I'll, I'll try and get off of my, um, a, um, my soapbox as I phrased it. So thanks for that question. Appreciate that one, Matt. How do you prioritize authenticated scans versus unauthenticated scan? Oh, I don't think you need to prioritize between them. Just looking at that question and from, looks like it's Brent, it's B-Rent. So I'm just assuming Brent, but thank you for that question. It is, I don't think you need to prioritize between them. I think they complement each other. And a little tidbit of info, um, here, I'll ask a question for something you need to think about for a second. Do you think you need to do both authenticated scans and unauthenticated scans inside your environment? Think about that one for a second. What do you think? One thing we've actually found out, and I wasn't actually, in, I didn't know this till probably not that long ago. I went digging after I was asked in a class. There are actually checks that we need, to, or sorry, that can be done by our scanners only in an authenticated scan. And there's checks that can only be done from an unauthenticated scan. So if you actually go digging on the vendor documentation, I'm gonna get some links posted out here in one second. I'm just gonna pull them up because I do have this. I talk about this in my course, but the vendors actually have details for us that say, yeah, actually you need to do this. It's like, what? I need to do both of these? You're kidding me. No, actually we have to. So I'm just trying to find the details for you right now and I will put it up there in the, Oh, where do they store this? There it is. A little bit of information for you from both. This is from Qualys, Rapid7, and Tenable. I've got, uh, there's actually a bunch of different links here describing which one comes from each. Uh, it's just 
Qualys. Uh, they give you a method of how you can actually find it out. You'll see the link coming up there in a second. Uh, Rapid7 is similar things, but they've got a, a link for us as well. And then we've got one coming in from Tenable. And it's similar again to the above link for how I can see what limitations we have inside the environment. So I have those. There should be four links in total that are um, out there. Hopefully I didn't miss one. One's with agent scans, one's with, yeah, there's two for Tenable, one Rapid7, one for Qualys. So we'll leave that one there. Hopefully I got all the information pulled up there for you correctly. But you do actually need to do both. And prioritizing, I don't think we actually need to prioritize between one over the other. It is complementary because you're going to find in an authenticated scan, a lot of the problems you will find in an authenticated versus the unauthenticated but what because and because there are some differences between the scans there are some checks that we cannot do from an unauthenticated scan versus unauthenticated my goodness getting myself tongue-tied here with this authenticated unauthenticated blah. but there are different checks some of them will be found the same and you'll be able to see that from your scan results but I, it wouldn't be an exclusive. If I found it in an unauthenticated scan and didn't find it authenticated, that means it's not there. Well, we can't say that. And those links at least give us some information in regards to how the different vendors, and those are the top three with Qualys, Tenable, Rapid7, telling us how I can actually find out which checks are being done that way. So I personally used to be of the opinion that, yeah, if I found an authenticated scan, that's more important than an unauthenticated. But then I found this out, let's argue, only about six to nine months ago. I always was the belief there was no difference if I, but yeah, there are checks. So understanding which ones you find in which method, they're going to complement each other. So hopefully that helps deal and answer that question for you. To seeing if there's anything out here yeah. Yeah. Authenticate. It's always a challenge for us just because it's a credential management problem we have to worry about now in the environment. And then you have the added benefits. Like a lot of people are thinking, well, I don't do authenticated scans. I have agents. Okay, fine. But an agent really is an authenticated scan. Why? Because I've installed it with the permissions it needs and it runs local on the system with those permissions. So it's actually doing an authentic equivalent of an authenticated scan inside the environment. So it's just a different method of delivering the same outcome. Instead of throwing all the traffic across your network, this is at least letting me get the information from a local agent. And then I just push the results out to the centralized console. So it still is an authenticated scan, even though you're doing agents, just it's the way it's getting delivered is being um, different for us in that perspective. So hopefully that helped answer that question. Oh my goodness. Lots of them. Just trying to see if there was any others coming up on here. Uh, bah, bah. I think that covered them all. Hopefully I didn't miss any, but there's lots of chatter on the what's going on here. So if I missed it, I apologize for that. I'll go back and take a look again, or I'll check afterwards as well. But I think I've dealt with all of those. So moving on, I was talking about threat intelligence and exploits availability, because that helps us understand which ones potentially in our environment, I've got a vulnerability and I know there's an exploit. Now I'm helping peel back, get more context to understand which is a more important vulnerability. And we have these available in our tools, as I mentioned. There is also a functionality inside CVSS. Ooh, an extension. Those temporal metrics. Anyone heard of temporal metrics? Yeah, what they help us do is they're providing us the ability to determine the impact of a vulnerability. Again, related to some basic threat information, ties into that with regards to how it's going to impact us inside our environment. The problem with Temporal, there's not a lot of tools that are using that CVSS extension. So if you wanna run with the Temporal metric extension, you're gonna end up using it, customization yourself internally, generating the fields that you need to be able to have the Temporal metrics um, and, and use them really, because there are very few tools that are helping us out from that perspective. And what we have in the Temporal metric groups, just to uh, state what they are, exploit code maturity, remediation level, and the report confidence. I had to try and remember what the three of them were there. So that's what we get from a temporal metric perspective. And that is done on a per vulnerability basis. Now, another piece of contextual information, staying with the threat intelligence, like basic exploit availability, 
good information to have. Step it back now to something a little more specific for my company. Ooh, I want internal intelligence. This is a more complex thing. Even doing some of the basic or the exploit availability can get complex, but leveraging threat intelligence. So it's not just, hey, this is what's going on out there in the public internet. Yeah, there's an attack going on. We're seeing people probing these ports. That all ties into some of the basic threat intelligence, I'll call it. This is what's happening out there in the big blad internet. We may want to pay attention to it. But the one I want to look at now, since I, I don't have time to go through everything, but what I want to look at now is internal threat intelligence. This is something that is specific for your organization. So as an example, I have from my external firewall, the big filter that we have on our internet pipe, people probing for a specific service that's running off of, oh, let's pick on Oracle from a database perspective. Okay, I've got someone who's probing me trying to find it. It's not just, yeah, this is going on out there. No, this is working on, this is a being targeted towards me as an example. It can be information really from any, anything that logs can actually give you a source from internal threat intelligence because it's something that's probing, firing off, be it your IDSs, your IPSs, the firewalls. It can be from, oh, let's go for Windows logs that come in from the systems themselves. It can be host-based firewalls. It can really be any device in our network that's logging. And as we start to think about this, oh my goodness, that's a whole lot of data. Yeah, that is. Doing internal threat intelligence, trying to leverage that in our vulnerability management program is going to require dedicated individuals looking at that internal sources of information, trying to gather the information and synthesize and analyze it so we can actually get the nuggets that come out of it to help us prioritize. So, Internal threat intelligence can be a huge benefit because if I have, let's say, an IDS sensor or an IPS has blocked some traffic on my internal network, or at least told me it existed with an intrusion detention sensor as opposed to the preventions, said this is inside on my internal segment. It saw, oh, let's go with, uh, I don't know, any kind of attack that it has the signature for. So uh, it's seeing, oh, oh, I'll dig out an oldie but goodie. Code Red, ooh, does anyone get, if you got the gray hair like I do, you'll remember Code Red or Configure, but some noisy attacks that are out there. If I'm seeing that on my internal segment, if you're seeing Code Red in your internal segment, wow. Um, it's still on the internet though. But just as an example, picking a, any vulnerability that is, I'm able to detect that someone is trying to use this on my internal segment, wow, I need to be able to deal and patch with that immediately, let alone the incident response team needs to be involved. But it helps us, again, get to the truly, really important pieces of information inside our environment. But as I said, threat intelligence, there's going to need to be a lot of work done with this. We are getting more and more automated tools that can help us out in our machine learning. The AI is starting to come up on here, and we're seeing a lot of development work happening in this front. But how do I get to this information? is going to take time and resources. I need to be able to ingest the information. I need to be able to process it. I then need to be able to actually do something with this in the company. But in my vulnerability management, I'll stay focused there because I'm biased and I just like vulnerability management more than the other parts of the security. To leverage it inside our vulnerability management program, we're gonna need those resources. So this is where this is a definitely a more mature piece of contextual information that we may want to use to help us prioritize vulnerabilities. You might have guessed as we were stepping through this today that it is from the um, level of complexity, because I started talking about the vulnerability type of contextual information, vulnerability-centric stuff with the CVSS and the ages. Then we moved into assets, a little harder for us to get. And then we moved into some of the threat intelligence. This is continuing to move us up from a maturity for what type of contextual information we are leveraging inside the company to try and help prioritize. Because like I said, there's lots of data with the threat intelligence that has to be properly analyzed, has to be looked at. Do I have a way to actually, even external sources, do I have a way to ingest it, actually communicate between our systems? There's so many pieces that can resources ultimately, which comes down to the tools we need to have and the people, to actually get the processing done, to be able to 
get useful information from it. I could have a threat intelligence feed coming in and I can take a tap off my IPS today, but if I don't have anybody looking at it, that's useless. So making sure we have the resources available that can help us leverage this contextual information is what we need to make sure is gonna be in place inside our organization. So I'm just checking to see, I see there's still, a, yeah, God, see, just some general comments. Uh, you came in to understand, just look and see, and I don't think, no, I think we're good on the comments. I just do a quick scan there. I don't see any questions to answer from that. But what this ties together for us, just to start wrapping this up, because we're about 45 minutes in, is, as I said, it's how do I understand which of these to use and how can I use them in my organization? I tried to give some examples as we step through this, but hopefully you've been able to see some of this contextual information, how it can help us actually get and answer the question of which one of these is the biggest problem. When we start off with the CVSS score, we know we start looking at the tens, let's say, but I still have 200,000 of those when I had 150 or 1.5 million vulnerabilities. And having that many does exist. One of the classes I taught in Dallas, I had two students in the room that over, had over 1.5 million or, uh, vulnerabilities inside their organization or their, across the entire organization. Lots of divisions, lots of subcomponents. The uh, components from that perspective, it's just all the divisions, et cetera, large companies, but it does exist. We're into that volume. All right, I saw there was something pop up there on the screen. It's a, yeah, not sure I understand the need for agents accessing internet. For example, SE works fine as long as it talk to your manager. I'm sure it can, uh, it's a case by case basis upon which software you're using. Yeah, they may not, the agents themselves probably don't need the internet access, but you're gonna need to be able to get the updates for the signatures for your agents for what they're checking for. So somehow you're going to have to get that updated information in. They may not need internet access to do their job, but to get updated information on the agent, you are going to need access. And some of our tools now that the vendors have, it's getting harder for us to actually work in a standalone environment. I work in, I have lots of standalone environments inside my organization. Nature of the beast of what it is that I do and the organization I work for. But it's getting that information in is always a problem. When I was running, um, when I worked at DRDC, a, a, um, a research organization, part of the government, was we had a lab environment, no internet connectivity. How do I get the updated signatures in? Just as a simple thing that I need for my vulnerability scanners, whether it's Tenable, whether it's Rapid, whether it's Qualys, any of the signatures that I need into the environment. I need to bring them in. How do I get the manual updates done? And a lot of our tools are, they're not forcing, but it's a lot harder for us to have them working when we don't have the connectivity or some of them are when we're running it as a SaaS offering, software as a service. So we do need access to some of that information. Otherwise we're gonna be stuck with a static view from when it did get installed and the signatures were put in. So at some point we do need to be able to bring in from the outside, not mandatory all the time. And some of it will come down to your risk. But looking at the tools, the more advanced the tools are getting, I'm seeing they're pulling the information constantly from the external sources coming into them, be it from the, the vulnerability scanner, having to connect back out to the vendor to be able to get the most updated uh, signatures. And this happens multiple times a day, be it for the exploits, be it new vulnerabilities that are posted out there. Now we have the checks for. All of this has to get in and processed in either network-based scan or push to the agents to be able to check. So having that connectivity starts to matter. Um, only because of the rapid advance or, or rapid change that's happening in our landscape. If you take a look at the vulnerabilities that have been released this year, I think the last time I looked, we were over 50,000 for this year. Wow. That's a whole lot of vulnerabilities that are out there. And we are, this, that was back at the beginning of October. So nine months of the year, hmm, let's say 50,000 vulnerability. Oh, let's, let's be nice. Let's say it was back, yeah, October, uh, 10, 10 months. Let's make it easy math. 50,000 vulnerabilities over 10 months, 5,000 a month. Let's round it to 30 days per month. 5,000 vulnerabilities over 30 days. It's 500 over three days. Oh my goodness, that's a whole lot every day coming out. 166.67, if I get my math right in my head. 
So let's just round that nicely down a little bit to 150 a day of new vulnerabilities. Yes, we do not have all of those in our environment, but until you get the triaging and knowing what's there, either you're manually triaging going, hey, I don't have this vulnerability, it's not a problem, or the tools just have to do their regular checks. It starts to overwhelm the security team as well, trying to manually validate all of these. So, uh, books about, I see there's a question, I have any suggestions on training or books about uh, CVSS or threat hunting? Oh my goodness, there's a long list on that. CVSS, I find the best source of information actually is from um, MITRE themselves. I have a link here. I'm going to quickly see if I can pull it up for the CVSS uh, details just to post that out in the channel as well. But it gives you the full breakdown of how CVSS is working, what each of the components are. Bear with me one second. I will find that link and get it posted out here just to have it. I know I have it nearby. CVSS. The details on this is uh, choice of having to try and cut and paste in here. And this will be for version three. Uh, this is actually uh, linking out to first.org. Just let me get back. Where's my so many live stream, so many windows open, so little time. Here's a link out, one that I have used, giving you the specifications for um, CVSS and all the different fields that are associated with it. Now, in regards to threat hunting, oh boy, <laughs> there are lots of books and information available on threat hunting. I don't have any right off the top of my head I'd be able to share with you in regards to what is going to be the best um, information from that perspective. I'm not, um, the work that I'm doing, I'm not as active in the threat hunting, so I don't have any that be, I'd say are I could give you right off the top of my head. There's probably some coming out from people inside the uh, the chat channel as well on the threat hunting. Feel free if you have any suggestions to post that out. I don't right now, I can dig some out. And there is a resource from SANS. Um, we have a, a link to some of popular books, et cetera. I remember something was put out about a year ago. I'll see if I can dig that one out afterwards and I'll post that in the Slack channel or not in the Slack channel, sorry. I'll post that out in the live stream channel um, afterwards just so you can see the information as well. Um, so we'll get some of that information out if, we, if what I can find and send out. But I think there's probably some people that have thrown some things at you there as well. Now, what else do we have here? See, you've got links. Uh, correct uh, to, yeah, I think that's answered the questions. So wrapping things up here, because I see we're just over 50 minutes, what we were trying to do here is show pieces of information that can help us get through the massive number of vulnerabilities. Some of these can be automatically done inside our scanners. We can start to break things up, be it from groupings, if we want to do it from an asset owner perspective or function. We can do it from asset value as well, just grouping things together inside of our tools. Our aging CVSS scores is done automatically for us inside the tools today. When you start getting into some of the more complex item though, maybe some on the owners, I might be limited by the number of groups I could do in my tool. Or when I start getting into the threat intelligence, internal stuff, I'm going to have to worry about getting some customized work done internal because I'm probably not going to have this available to me from an out-of-the-box solution. A lot of them, we do have availability. Like I said, you've got the Kenas, the Brinkas, the Rapid 7s, the Tenables, our Qualys. All of them give us some functionality that we're going to be able to use to try and put this contextual information together. And as I mentioned with the, let's pick on the tagging from the cloud environment, I did mention that we actually have the ability to automatically check if tags have been created and then don't allow the resource to continue being created if the tag entry is not valid. So I can ensure and enforce that I'm having the contextual information available that my tools then are gonna be able to leverage or worst case, my spreadsheet, I can sort and filter on that field. But it's putting this together trying to bring it in so we can see this. As I said, some of our tools, we can do functionality there. The higher end items, we may have to do customization, going into our own, pulling the data from our data warehouse, doing it in our customized reporting to be able to do the breakups and joining of information together because not the tools are just not there for everything that we want them to do. But that's how we can step it together. 
And then stepping back into the last piece of contextual information that ties really into any of these categories, and I've mentioned it as the compensating controls. Knowing whether you have a compensating control in place can definitely help us prioritize. Because if I know I've already put firewall rules in place, I've got expert monitoring going on, I have the services being blocked, connected on the local system itself, that may have mitigated it enough that I don't need to worry about patching the problem. That's why I said, it's, I mentioned off uh, compensating controls and how we've remediated it. Because remediation might not be patching. I may have remediated it to an acceptable level of risk. So that is a possibility. So that piece of contextual information, we need to understand as well in order to properly deal with our prioritization. Now, one last thing here. I don't see any new questions up. I see this chat going on. It's great to see. Uh, yeah, I see there's one question there or comment. So interesting. Maybe even more interesting is how all these, the, the prioritization is something the ownership board feels is something they should worry about. No money, no sense of responsibility in the matter. List lots of vulnerabilities to priorities. Yeah, there is. And that ties into something what I'm actually going to end up talking about. I have another webcast or another live stream coming up on November 17th. And that one's actually titled Vulnerabilities and Reports and Metrics, Oh My. And that question and comment actually is going to tie in because it's how we actually get our reporting and communicating some of the information out. So looking at what kind of metrics we might want to deal, how we can actually do that reporting. So if it is something you're interested in, I'm going to have an entire live stream on that on November 17th. So... Mark your calendars for that. I know there's stuff Sands is posting out on it as well. Just keep it down there. If you're interested in that, we'll be talking more on how to understand and present that prioritization and generating the metrics that are going to help us. So I think that's answered. I've looked at all the questions in there. I'll go back afterwards just in case I missed something because there was tons of chat going on. It just kept scrolling and I might have missed something. Wasn't intentional. I'll go back and deal with that and answer those questions. But I want to thank you for joining me in today. We're almost done our hour here. I want to wrap it up and keep it to the time slot. But I've seen on the screen a couple of times. If you do want to connect out, you can do it on Twitter. You can do it on LinkedIn. And if you have any questions about today's live stream or on vulnerability management, please feel free to reach out. I'm more than happy to try and answer the questions if you have something. So thank you once again for joining us today. And we'll see you hopefully on November 17th or in Management 516, the class. But thank you again, everybody, for taking the time. Truly appreciate it. Hope you enjoy the rest of your day.